Did you know that the first and worst sin was not in the Garden of Eden, but according to Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 to 15, was in heaven when Satan in his pride imagined himself equal with God? Jesus said, whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. While the book of Proverbs warns us in Proverbs 16 and verse 18, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. We see so many examples of such pride and self-destruction around us in everyday life. The news stories of the singers or actors, politicians, sports stars or members of the royal family who believe their own hype and publicity who think that they are untouchable and for a while it seems as if they are until a character fault a sinful weakness brings them down and they fall from fame to shame the exalted humbled and the humble exalted there is a dramatic example of this here in Acts chapter 12 in the life of King Herod Agrippa I. One moment he's at the height of power and the next he's below ground in his grave. One moment he's talked of as a god and in the next moment he's standing before the true and living God. So let's look closer at his life. Learn the lessons that the Bible is trying to teach us here. Let's remember the background to this passage. If you have your Bible, uh, take it, open it at Acts chapter 12, and we're going to focus on verses 19 to 24. Remember how at the beginning of this chapter, Herod Agrippa had persecuted the Christian church. He had opposed the message of life and uh, truth through faith in Jesus Christ. He had tried to kill Peter, one of the famous apostles, and he had murdered James, the brother of John. Pride is making Herod Agrippa an enemy of God, and pride makes many people enemies of God today. So open your Bible and have a look with me, and notice these things. Notice first Herod's opportunism. Look at the almost incidental words in verse 19 where Luke records that Herod went from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there a while. Caesarea was a large and cosmopolitan port on the coast of Israel. It had been built by Herod Agrippa's grandfather, Herod the Great, and it remains worth a visit today. There are some amazing archaeological uh, remains to be found there. It was much more like a Roman or Greek city than a Jewish city. It had a hippodrome where they would race horses and chariots, a theater where they would put on planes. It was the headquarters of the Roman government uh, and the legionaries. And it was a, a city of um, metropolitan and cosmopolitan trade. We know some of the interesting details of what Herod Agrippa did when he got there because they are recorded in the writings of the Jewish historian Flavius Josephus. And what we're reading here in the Bible, I need to emphasize this time and again, is history. It's not legendary. It's not mythology. This is something that ha actually happened in uh, history. And Josephus tells us that uh, Herod Agrippa arranged some celebratory Greek-style games in honor of the Roman Emperor Claudius. Claudius had recently invaded Britain, uh, defeated Caractacus and his armies. And uh, now he was coming back to Rome and his victory was being celebrated. He was being proclaimed as a god. Caesar is lord. And uh, Herod Agrippa was a friend of Claudius. And so he was making much of his friend's outward success. The point is this. This was hypocrisy. It was political opportunism. Herod Agrippa, when he was in Jerusalem, had appeared as a faithful and good Jew. 
He had attended the services at the Jewish temple. Uh, He was asked to read the scriptures because he was king. And the rabbis report there were tears in his eyes as he read out the scriptures in the temple. But now he was in Caesarea, a different city, a different culture, and he became a different person. Proclaiming Caesar is Lord and worshipping him as a God. Living a very different lifestyle. And from what we can gather from Herod Agrippa's history and records, uh, he was a political opportunist. He would be whoever you wanted him to be to get you to do whatever he wanted you to do for his personal advancement and benefit. It is a character weakness to be a people pleaser, especially if it means that we're not pleasing the one true God. As Christians, we need to be people of principles, people of integrity, people who say what they mean, mean what they say, do what they said, people who live to godly standards and not seek worldly success. Notice next Herod Agrippa's oppression of other people in verse 20. The Bible tells us that he had been quarreling with the people of Tyre and Sidon. They now joined together, sought an audience with him. Having secured the support of Blastus, a trusted personal servant of the king, they asked for peace because they depended on the king's country for their food supply. What's going on here? Well, it's a a trade deal. And Herod Agrippa is a bit of a bully. Uh, Not only had he persecuted the church, but now he's pressurizing the small independent cities of Tyre and Sidon into an unequal trade deal. Think Brexit and the modern trade wars that we read about between East and West and North and South and rich and poor. Nothing has really changed, has it, in human nature. Human beings are mostly selfish and think of our own self-interest unless Jesus transforms us from the inside out. Tyre and Sidon were economically dependent on Judea. They had no real manufacturing base of their own. They were traders with ships uh, up and down the coast. Herod Agrippa was self-seeking and very ready to throw his weight around. He was the king of Judah, king of Judea, friend of Caesar. And in his arrogance and his pride, he forces these cities into an unequal trade deal to do his will, to meet his needs. And for a time, this arrogance and pride seems to work. But life and God seems to regularly humble the exalted, to prick the balloon of the puffed up and self-righteous, the self-important, who believe themselves better than others and worth more than anybody else's worth. Such arrogant people who would force people to do their will. And Herod is going to be toppled from his pedestal of pride. Many years ago, I remember a preacher talking about how uh, the Caesars of Rome were so arrogant uh, and looked down upon the Christians and treated them like dogs. But he said, now we call our children James and Peter and we call our dogs Caesar. God is watching. He sees how we treat each other. And one day, one way or another, we will all answer to him. Notice thirdly, Herod Agrippa's opprobrium. Is that a new word for you? Okay, I admit I chose it because it fits with opportunity, uh, opportunism and oppression. But it also fits with what we find in verses 21 to 23. Opprobrium is shameful contempt. And Herod Agrippa has a shameful contempt towards God. Now remember, this story that we read in the book of Acts is also recorded in the history of the Jews written by a man who lived at the time called Flavius Josephus. 
And Josephus' account is very similar uh, to the account in the book of Acts, uh, reading them side by side. It's like reading the same news report in two different newspapers. Herod Agrippa is going to use these games in honor of uh, Caesar's victory in Britain to announce a trade deal with Tyre and Sidon to the public. He wants to show off his power, his strength in comparison to these cities' weakness. So he comes to the theater with robes inlaid with silver thread that glow and glitter radiant and dazzling in the sunlight on that day. He looks almost divine. He, he looks as if the glory of God is shining out uh, from his clothing. And as he speaks and tells the public all about what he's achieved and his success as their king, his flunkies and his flatterers play to his pride. This is the voice of a God, not a man. But God is watching. God is listening. And God has had enough with Herod Agrippa. The one true God is about to act. Pride is the first and worst of human sins because it is the root of all our other sins. And Herod Agrippa is struck down by God and dies. The Jewish historian Josephus says that Herod had a warning. Uh, he saw an owl, which was a symbol in those days of impending disaster. He had an opportunity to repent, but he didn't. He took five days to die. He died at the age of 54 at uh, Easter time, 44 AD. Uh, something inside had uh, burst or ruptured. Uh, an infection that got in. It is an inglorious end for someone who or just a few days before had been happy for people to think that he was as good as God himself. And now all of this is in contrast with what we find in verse 24. Remember that persecuted, browbeaten Christian church in Jerusalem? where James had been martyred and Peter had, flee, uh, had fleed, uh, run, uh, escaped, and uh, others had been meeting in secret and at night time, that small, little, humble group of believers. Well, in Acts 12 and verse 24, it says, straight after the death of Herod, but the word of God continued to increase and to spread. The church of Jesus Christ is continuing not only to survive, but to thrive in these desperate circumstances. That reminds us in this present day that God is at work and his word is going forth and it is achieving his purpose even when outwardly it might seem we are in difficult times. God will have his way and no one will stand in his way. His church will thrive, his church will survive, and his kingdom will come. And there is nothing anyone on earth can do to stop our God from fulfilling his promises to you and to me. Nothing can separate us from his love, his truth, his care. So what do we learn from this story altogether? It is a powerful reminder of the self-destructive nature of human pride. It is an example of God humbling the proud and exalting the humble. It is a challenge to us whether we will be those who please people or those who please God, those who seek material uh, and positional rewards or spiritual and eternal rewards. Remember, Jesus said, what good is it if you gain the world and lose your soul? Matthew 16, 26. What good was it for Herod to be proclaimed a God and wear silver clothing that glittered in the sunlight and rule a nation when he comes to stand before God and his sins are to be judged? Instead of bigging ourselves up, 
It is better to humble ourselves, to admit our faults, to seek the Lord and seek his forgiveness, to treat other people the way that we would like them to treat us, to live a godly, not a worldly life, and by godly and not worldly standards. And we need to remember as Christians when we give our testimonies or come to the front before others in church, are we there to glorify ourselves or are we there to glorify God? Let us point to him. We are sinners saved by grace. Jesus says, those who exalt themselves will be humbled, but those who humble themselves will be exalted. God bless you.